Hello and welcome to Intelligence Squared with me, Carl Miller. Uh, we're recording here in London, of course, on May the 24th, uh, and I'm excited, real excited, to introduce our guest today, Darren Asimoglu. He's an acclaimed economist. He's taught as a professor in the Massachusetts Institute for Technology since 1993, and is the author of best-selling books, including Why Nations Fail and The Narrow Corridor. His new book, which we're discussing today, is called Power and Progress, Our Thousand-Year-Old Struggle Over Technology and Prosperity. Darren, thanks so much for coming. Thanks, Carl. It's great to be here. All right. So um, let's start with the um, overall um, idea, perhaps, that you're trying to kill with the book. Tell us about the, the kind of uh, the, the, the bandwagon of, of progress and why that's wrong. Yeah. So let me actually be step take back, take one step back. What we are, in some sense, attacking is a deep-rooted techno-optimism, which claims that technology, by its nature, is always good for humanity, and it has a preordained, essentially definitive path upon which we are bound to progress unless we somehow block it. And if you put these two together, you arrive to a worldview in which there may be transition costs. Some people may suffer temporarily, but ultimately we're all going to benefit whatever happens so long as we are working towards technological progress. And this is what we want to push against. And we want to push against that because, A, we believe, based on history and economics, that there are many ways in which you can use technologies that do not generate these broad-based benefits. And second, that the path of technology is very malleable. There's a lot of choice which specific direction you develop it with very different distributional consequences. And the bandwagon of progress is essentially the name we give to the body of work in economics that is part of this argument which says, you know, as long as technology improves your capabilities to produce goods and services, it's going to increase wages. So it is sort of a happy story that labor demand and firms' desire to increase their scale are sufficient forces to translate some of the technological improvements into benefits for workers. And we question that. How how old is this argument? Because of course, like I think th those of us that are living through the current revolution might trace it back to the kind of Bay Area libertarians and a certain vision coming from Silicon Valley. But is this a kind of argument which we've always been told as as a, as a, as, a, as a culture and as a society um, has uh, uh, stretching back through the various revolutions which have previously previously swept through um, the way that we live? Yes, and yes, in a broad way. Humans live in communities, and they have to coordinate, they have to follow some sort of common path. And so they have to be convinced of accepting certain arrangements. So the argument that whatever is being chosen by leaders is for the common good, I think is as old as humanity. And sometimes it is. Sometimes when a band of hunter-gatherers choose to go north rather than south, that could in fact be exactly what they need to do, and a leader may be the one who catalyzes that decision. But in many, many places, especially since the beginning of settled agricultures, leaders have also told us, toil harder and that's good for society. You're going to get your reward in the other world, or this is your station in life. But the specific version of the productivity bandwagon techno-optimism, actually you start seeing that in a very clear version, for example, in the middle, starting in the middle of the 18th century with the British Industrial Revolution. So ideas that technological progress will generate benefits, then those will start becoming broadly shared through the labor market, through improvements in quality and product variety. You see that already in some of the uh, you know, forerunners of modern economics, who were amazingly revolutionary in their way of thinking. You know, Adam Smith, I, how could I disagree with his super amazing intellectual <laughs> leadership? I'm an economist. But Adam Smith was a firm believer in the productivity bandwagon. He 
did not want to entertain the idea that technological improvements could, for example, create joblessness. And David Ricardo, by the way, who is perhaps the second most important economist after Adam Smith, also started there. He was a member of parliament. As you know, he made speeches to parliament saying machinery will not create unemployment. But then he changed his mind. And then he started, uh, he added a chapter to his uh, uh, principles of economics saying, you know, uh, actually, I'm worried about new machinery creating joblessness, and 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 so had a turn turnaround on that. So so there's there's been a debate on this all the time, but when economists came back to it at the beginning of the 20th century, it was again the more optimistic take that was uh, was the one that was adopted. Mm. So does capital? Do, 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 and the elites that wield it, do they always win from these revolutions? No. No. Uh, I mean, first of all, there are many disruptions. Inflation, world wars, they led to big losses to capital owners in the 20th century. But the reason why I hesitated is actually, if you find a path of technology that is more pro-human, more useful for workers, we can talk more about what that is in a second, but actually firms benefit from that. The best example for that, I would say, is the social democratic equilibrium that emerged in Sweden after you know, the Great Depression and uh, uh, sort of the, the, the victory of the uh, Swedish Workers' Party in the 1932 election that led to a corporatist model that was quite cooperative between capital and labor. Labor had very strong bargaining power, high wages, social welfare programs. But at the same time, that whole system was very encouraging for businesses to invest in education and technology, sorry, in, 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 in machinery and technology, choose a path of technology that was both good for their competition in export markets, but at the same time help workers. And businesses made a lot of profits out of that. So there is a path that's actually good for capital out of this as well. But, you know, in the US, for example, over the last four and a half decades, many business managers and many capital owners or you know the richest sort of people who control corporations have gone much more into a strategy that squeezes labor hard tries to reduce labor costs automation surveillance again that can generate profits for capital but it's not the only thing that generates profit for capital i gave a very long answer to this because i i don't want to create the impression that there is a mortal conflict between capital and labor mm. i think creating the right type of technological path can be beneficial for capital as well. Mm. Well, Darren, we I know lots of people listen to this are going to be very anxious, possibly, um, maybe excited as well about the current revolution we're living through. Of course, artificial intelligence, and you can't move for someone asking ChatGPT something at the moment. So we, we're of course going to get to that. But I know in the book you trace a, a much longer thread looking at the revolutions of the past and what they can teach us about our current moment. And I think, you know, as a as a kind of a one-time historian myself, that is an important thing for us also to consider and to dwell on just for a moment to consider the time we live in now. So tell us about the Panama Canal. And and the lessons that that the, the that that has for us around the kind of power of persuasion, perhaps agenda setting, and powerful visions. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think if you look at history, especially you know, of course, history is there to be interpreted to some degree. So the lenses through which you look at them is important. But if you look at it through these lenses of people acting as technological leader, visionaries. Uh, articulating the common good and an optimism about the future of technology, you see so many examples of it. And you see successful applications and you see disastrous ones. And the Panama Canal is very important because it is the, it's the big project of Ferdinand de Lesseps, who was you know, the epitomization of the techno-optimism of the second half of the 19th century. And he was very successful because he brought exactly that vision, a belief in technology, a belief in trade, small people will contribute capital, build a big public infrastructure, and that's going to spearhead 
trade between East and West, and it's going to open up uh, oceanic routes, and technology is going to come to make things that appeared infeasible feasible. He, that was exactly his shtick for the Suez Canal. And people were skeptical. He pushed. He was very skillful in building coalitions, cajoling people, getting uh, French investors on board, getting Egyptians' uh, 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 ruler on board. And he succeeded. All his techno-optimism paid off. When people said, no, you cannot build a canal at the sea level without the locks in Suez, he said, no, we'll find a way of working out the technology. And he turned out to be right. But that's the problem. That success made him even more hubristic. And that success was always a success from his own point of view. For example, he didn't care about coarse laborers in, 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 in Egypt who were not beneficiaries of uh, the Suez Canal. And he brought the same set of blinders, the same confidence, the same rhetoric, the same techno-optimism to the Panama Canal, where the conditions were very different, and it was a complete disaster. He went in thinking he could do exactly the same, but the in two ways. The Panama was very different. First of all, there was no way you could build a canal without locks, without doing a much, much bigger scale project. And second, the local conditions, especially yellow fever, malaria, in the rainy season, meant that the type of heavy labor-based approach wouldn't be feasible. As a result, 22,000 plus people died. Thousands of the best engineers from France perished. Me, millions of millions of dollars equivalent of money was lost by many many small investors. You know, it was a complete disaster because he was approaching it with the same set of blinders that had become more confident because of his earlier successes. So, if techno optimism, then the Panama Canal proves is 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 something which can lead us in the wrong direct, direction technologically, is the next historical epoch you look at settled agriculture, evidence of even when the revolution might pay off in terms of productivity increases, that might not be a good thing for society and for most of us that live within it. Or I would say it's not enough to create broad-based prosperity. So the let's just, you know, to keep it brief, let's just take one formative technological breakthrough in the medieval era, uh, water mills and then windmills that both really completely revolutionized a lot of the production. But, you know, great amazing improvements in labor productivity, amazing improvements in what we could do, uh, but they weren't enough to increase the living conditions of the majority of the population who were working as farming workers. Why? Because those workers had no organization. They were still tied by feudal or servile relations. There was no competition. Windmills, for example, were completely monopolized by abbots and uh, and a very small group of uh, uh, noble landholders. No competition. Uh, actually, in many ways, coercive relations intensified. And that's not the kind of institutional structure that's sufficient to generate broad-based prosperity. When have we, Darren, most successfully kind of pushed back, I guess, against the kind of um, collectivizing kind of impulses of these revolutions, uh, you know, and either, f I, I guess, through either social or institution reform, either forced the benefits to become more widely distributed or forced technology to be developed in a certain direction, which led to more widely distributed outcomes. Yeah, I think two examples are really inspiring and very well understood by now. One is what started happening in the UK, for instance, in the second half of the 19th century. And the second is what happened in throughout the industrialized world in the three, three and a half decades after World War II. In both cases, at least Simon Johnson and my interpretation is very much consistent with our conceptual framework. You had the two pillars of broad-based prosperity, shared prosperity. One, a technology that was worker-friendly. It wasn't just automating work. It was creating new tasks for workers. It was helping workers become more productive in their tasks. And second, it was a, a bolstered by an institutional structure that created bargaining power, negotiation power for workers so that they could not be completely monitored, uh, hugely disciplined, coerced into relationship, and they could ask for a fair share of the surplus that they created. In the second half of the 19th century, this is very telling because it is such a contrast to what happened the previous 100 years. The beginning of the Industrial Revolution was a harsh time for the working people. 
real incomes for workers, by and large, did not increase much for about 100 years. Their working hours intensified, their working conditions worsened, their living conditions worsened in infested, very unhealthy, very crowded cities. So the first 100 years of the Industrial Revolution produced very little benefit for the working people. Why did that change in the second half? Democracy, civil service, becoming more interested in cleaning up cities and providing public services education, and trade unions. So trade unions became legal. Things like master-servant acts became uh, uh, abolished in uh, the 1870s. And so that created the bargaining power. Together with that, both because of the technologies coming from the United States, because of the push from unions and other factors, technologies that started increasing workers' capabilities in new manufacturing tasks and white-collar tasks started spreading as well. And you see exactly the same factors in the decades after World War II. There was a lot of automation, but automation was not the only thing that technology did. Lots of new tasks, lots of new activities for workers, new industries, and bolstered by a strong labor movement and a democratic process. And those two pillars, I think, are really critical for understanding these processes, and their dismantling is also very important for understanding what went on after the 1980s. Right. Artificial intelligence. We've arrived. So... What historical echoes, when you sit back and you consider the moment we're living through now, what are the historical echoes that you think are most poignant or most important for us to remember? You know, do you see the the powerful visions of the Panama Canal? Do you see the prospect of workers losing out like some of the agricultural reforms? Do you see either the prospect or the reality of institutional reform like post-World War II reconstruction? What are the big ideas or moments of the past you think that we need to remember? All of the above. <laughs> well, that was a, that's a nice short answer. Um, well, let me, let me say two things and then we can do. First of all, I said 1980s because I think we cannot understand the current moment in isolation of how we've used digital technologies over the last 40 years. AI is different, but it is a continuation of the digital revolution that started sometime in the 1970s and it really came into fruition in the 1980s. Now, some people will criticize me and say AI is completely different from previous computers, and we can debate that, but there is actually a lot of continuity in terms of what AI is being used and how it's being processed. That's the first thing. So we'll talk about digital technologies. But second, yes, if you want to see historical parallels, de la sepsis panama hubris, Jeremy Bentham's panopticon, idea of monitoring workers, monitoring schools, monitoring hospitals, the medieval separation of elites to non-elites, the two-tiered society, the early stages of the British Industrial Revolution where, you know, there was this idea that meritocratically the innovators, the entrepreneurs would benefit and the lazy not so productive people could be left behind. All of these, plus standard oils, monopolization of key resources, all of them bunched into one, I think we get AI. I, I know you make much in your book of the idea that actually the directions that technology goes in is a choice that we make. And, and it can go in one direction, it can go in another. Um, and that the current directions in AI are around automation and the replacement of workers and how that might, you know, um, have all kinds of deleterious and harmful consequences for society. Beginning to think about solutions and responses now, what do you do about that kind of thing? Because it, it often feels like this idea of permissionless innovation, you know, the idea that a tiny number of elite technologists, you know, um, with access to vast reserves of capital and talent, kind of make these decisions themselves about, about which direction they want to go on, and they made that decision around automation. How do we, people listening to this, policymakers maybe, writers, academics, what, what do we do about that seemingly kind of fairly essential nature of, of the way that technology development actually works? Well, uh, I think those are exactly the right questions. 